on the record. On the record. This is News Talk. A very good morning to you all. It is Sunday, the 23rd of December. Time to get the finger out. There's plenty to be done in the next two days. This is On the Record on News Talk 106 to 108 with me, Gavin Riley. Lots coming up on the programme this morning, but we will start off with a look at the Sunday newspapers along with our panel. Sheila Riley is the head of digital with Iconic News, the regional newspaper group, and a former editor of the Longford Leader. Good morning, Sheila. Happy Christmas. Good morning, Gavin. Uh, Fergus Finlay is a former CEO of Bernardo's, now a member of the Charities Regulator and a former advisor to the Labour Party. Good morning, Fergus. Morning, Happy Gavin. Christmas. Uh, and Michael Nugent is the chairman of Atheist Ireland among many other things. Good morning, Michael. Happy Christmas holidays. Good morning, and, and happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's, well, it's, not, it's not a Christian festival. It predates Christian Christianity by centuries. I get we're going to tease that out. The story in the front page of the Sunday Independent, uh, a nation yearns for meaning at Christmas. Uh, do you think so? Well, the implication is that the nation survives without a sense of meaning or a need for meaning for 11 months of the year, which I think is a bit odd. I think it's the <laughs> same throughout the Touché. year. It's part of, it's just part of the human condition is, is that we enjoy a sense of meaning. We enjoy a sense of connectedness with other people. We enjoy relationships and we enjoy being absorbed in various activities. And religions hijack those natural human attributes and claim that they're religious attributes, but they're not. And then they, they attach them onto pre- existing festivals and claim that they're religious You, you don't think religion tries to argue that that sort of sense of that, that part of the human condition that sense of belonging and togetherness is part of the way that we might have been intelligently designed anyway? Well, the idea of intelligent design, of course, is is, is just a, a, a made up attempt to make uh, the idea of creation sound scientific, which it isn't. I mean, we know how we evolved. We know that we're social animals, and that that because of that, we have evolved senses of empathy, compassion, uh, cooperation, reciprocity. They're human attributes. They're nothing to do with religion, and we celebrate them all year round, not just at Christmas. Uh, Fergus, do you find any uh, irony in the fact that the nation is spending more and more, and yet is complaining that apparently Christmas is? Because coming to commercial. Well, the irony I found was in the headline uh, that a nation yearns for meaning at Christmas. If you read the details of the poll, the headline should really be that the nation yearns for drink at Christmas. Um, <laughs> Which spending, is also true. We're spending far more in <laughs> but pubs. But less newsworthy. Uh, spending far more in pubs, especially in Dublin. Uh, Leinster people drink less, apparently, yeah. and spend less in pubs. These were quite we striking We spend enormous amounts of money in restaurants at Christmas. Um, uh, I don't know what meaning we're finding in the amounts of money we're spending on drink and food, but um, I, I I uh, I just think the whole thing is a bit bizarre. I I, I mean, Michael is right. You know, if we yearn for meaning, we yearn for meaning all year long. We don't yearn for meaning at Christmas. So we don't find particular. Christmas is different only because it's a time when there's downtime, when family is together, uh, when you're supposed to, and many of us do, uh, enjoy, you know, um, being with our families in peace and quiet and, uh, and and all that. And that's the meaning of Christmas. Um, if a nation is yearning for meaning at Christmas, um, it's missing something, do you know? Mm. Uh, one of the, the things that Fergus was referring to there, by the way, it's, it's further down in the piece uh, Dublin residents are far ahead of those in other regions when it comes to going out of the town it says in Munster people expect to spend 93 euro on restaurants but in Dublin the average spend on down, dining out will be 228 euro Leinster households will spend 91 euro on pubs while in Dublin the average household spend will be 210 euro which first of all it makes me wonder Sheila whether uh, those of us who live in the capital are getting just completely screwed oh you're just getting totally not really ripped off absolutely um, yeah I so mean the last time what do you pay what do you pay for a pint up here now is it, it must uh, be a tenner at this stage well, is it it's, it's, it's over five now and it's always very demoralising when you can't justify your confidently hand over five euro and expect to be able to no. pay or someone to come back to ask you for another that only 20 happens cents. The, the further away you get from the city, <laughs> yeah. that, 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 that's, that's, that's You're just then. buying a pint for yourself, not for anybody else as well. But the, and that's the only yearning for the meaning of Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> the only, we were talking about this before we came into the studio and the three of us here don't really go into pubs. So there are people who are spending 600 euro in the pubs mm. instead of 200 euro because otherwise you wouldn't make up these averages. Yeah. I don't, I, in fact, I don't even know where these figures come from. Um, I, I, I think it is possible to eat out in Dublin for less than 200 quid. Mm. Um, uh, you may not choose to, but if you don't choose to, you don't choose to. Um, I, I, you know, the, the, the sad thing, in a way, is if, if that's the only meaning we can find in Christmas, is stuffing ourselves and filling ourselves full of drink. And I say that as somebody who 
confidently expects to be <laughs> completely <laughs> stuffed by by uh, Tuesday evening. Yeah, and so say all of I, us. Yeah, uh, no, I, I think there is more to it than that. Like I, Brendan O'Connor, or Brendan O'Connor's article in the Endo is, is very good he, mm. about this. You know, stop droning on, don't let guilt wreck your, wreck, wreck your Christmas. Yeah, so like the, the, as point. in the misfortune of others shouldn't be enough to cloud your enjoyment. Yeah, of. he makes a number of really good points, and then the first thing he does to say, which I think is so true, because this is me. If somebody asked me in a poll, do you feel Christmas has become so too commercial? I would say yes. Right. Mm. Then I was in Aldi yesterday and I literally bought Aldi cab and out of it. There was nothing left. There couldn't have been anything yeah. left in it after me because the car was just packed to the gills. So he makes the point, you know, I think I saw that 86% of people out shopping yesterday. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think we were all there. Do you know? And I we think all panic. We just panic. There is that sense of... We oh, panic Jesus. at the end. Well, yeah. It's only two days, like, you know. Well, the, the panic is, is the reason why supermarkets are open 24 hours for three or four days before Christmas, isn't it? Because of the panic that, oh my God, you might have bought one slab too few of the beer for whatever cousin or aunt or uncle is coming over by. that might possibly drop but by. It, but it yeah. isn't just about that. There is a kind of another element of uh, consumerism. We might feel it's too consumer uh, consumeristic, but the reality is Fergus is completely right. Christmas, it's about family. It's about kind of the good and decency that's out there. And and and, and in fairness, Brendan O'Connor makes that point too. There's a lot of decency out there and it's kind of a, it's about celebrating that, the goodness in people mm. and the goodness in human mm. beings and in all those relationships. And I think it's also have. it is about remembering and I don't want anyone to feel guilty, but I mean, I know, I know my Myself, families who are going to have miserable Christmases. I know families who are terrified of Christmas. I know children, uh, and I've worked with children um, who, for whom Christmas is just another awful day in the mm-hmm. year, uh, a day of disappointment. And uh, and uh, you know, and th- we can't forget that either. You is, know. is the disappointment? Uh, how acutely do they feel it? Do they feel that it's compounded because they are aware that other people aren't being disappointed, so that their their disadvantage in life feels like it hits home that bit harder? I, or I, is every day just an equal? Story? I have conflicting experiences this time of year because. Because I, I impersonate a certain other person. Um, I, I have a red suit that I put on, and I, I, I go out and I, I work with uh, you know projects mm. and so on. Uh, and I meet kids. Um, uh, I, I had to persuade a child in on the south side of Dublin the other day that yes, Santa does find you if you're in a hotel. Yeah. I had to, I had to work hard at persuading. Then I met another kid who said, "I don't want anything for Christmas because my mummy's just got a new house for Christmas, and that's all we need." Yeah. So there are good things and bad things happening, mm-hmm. but the bad things are pretty bad. You know, they're pretty terrible, uh, and I think it, you know, just give a, a minute's thought to it I think would be would be something worth doing mm. you know? I think it's really encouraging to hear though that some children still have that sense of perspective that know that what they've already got what they want for Christmas I, I, I want nothing for Christmas because my mummy got a new house that's, that's children, what she children said. are far so more likely to, to have that. Those, that sense of reality and justice and compassion mm. than adults it's kind of beaten out of us as yeah, we while, while the rest of us are going and spending 220 quid on dinner apparently um, <laughs> Sheila um, Santa's been coming to your house uh, for a couple of years as well has yeah. it changed your experience of it materially do you get that kind of that, that warm you know fuzzy glow because of this idea that people are taking it in for the first time. Absolutely, yeah. When Santa when Santa came back to our house, my son is seven now. Uh, with the first couple of years we're in my mother's house and the first couple of the Christmases and she said and Santa knew where to go he did and he always does always does and he always does and that's the thing that children need to remember and I remember her saying to me isn't it wonderful to have Santa back in the house and it just is Mm. it really does uh, spread that bit of extra magic dust you know on on the whole experience on the whole Christmas experience totally and utterly changes it and yeah it means that you're not outspending how much was it on drink Uh, Uh, how much was it on drink yeah I I, I, I'm so from last yeah. night, I can't it's remember. Not your, you're not 200 and something in Dublin. Yeah, yeah. Not Apparently it's, it's in Dublin. 4 euros 50 in Cavan. So you're all right. Well, oh, that's you know, okay that's, then. So that, that, that's, that's, where totally su- that's where supply and demand meets, isn't it? Because Cavan people are only willing to meet a demand for a certain price. Uh, well, that's it, as long as everybody knows that and understands that. Move <laughs> to Cavan, folks. There you go. Um, Michael, I saw you observing uh, on Twitter a few days ago that you and your, your colleagues in AD Starnham were uh, out for your Christmas drinks, your Christmas party. And there was a flood of replies saying, hang on, no, wait, atheists can't, can't celebrate Christmas. Stop trying to reappropriate Christian holidays. You made your point, obviously, that it is in itself a reappropriated holiday and that other things exist. Um, but to what degree do you celebrate, commemorate, mark, observe Christmas the same as people of a faith would do? Uh, well, you, you could ask it the other way around. In what way do people of faith celebrate Christmas well, in the same true. way as I do? Mm. Uh, well, the way that I do is uh, first thing in the morning, I listen to Slade's Merry Christmas, everybody. 
which is, I suppose, depending on when you grow up, that's what you're going to associate with. It's secular angelus religion. It is, it is yeah. yeah. And, and, and for people with no taste. <laughs> <laughs> for people, I, 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 if we're going to start an argument now about Slade, Slade are one of the best rock bands. Oh, mother, uh, you know, yeah. and, and that's probably kind of unrepresentative of them, but it is the best Christmas anthem. Mm. So I, I go to my old childhood home uh, and have dinner with my brothers and sister um, I have another slight difference than, than a lot of people I'm a vegan so I would have a, a, a vegan dinner rather than the traditional turkey and so on is, is there a deluxe vegan dinner that you can have in the same way that other people roll out the turkey or the goose or the turkey and ham is there a, like a deluxe vegan style is there an extra special tofu you can get or, or what do you take well, I tend like? to not like the, the processed foods I don't like being reminded of the fact that uh, you know something is, is made to look like a, a, a um, a dead animal. So, so I, I, I tend to prefer just nut roast or something like that. Mm. Um, you know, roasted cauliflower. Uh, you know, there, there's lots of things that you can have that, that are just as nice. So we do that. You know, we we, uh, we watch reruns of Morecambe and Wise. We watch Top of the Pops. We uh, just do that, those, those type of things. And we remember our parents who are both dead. My younger brother, Billy, who died quite young. My uh, late wife, Anne. We remember them, mm. and we do the the normal things that 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 everybody does at, at this. It's, it's essentially it's a midwinter festival. It's it's a, the celebrating and remembering the the turn of the season. Do you indulge in the most traditional of Christmas pastimes, which is to get into heated arguments with your siblings over dinner about your views on the world and politics and whatnot? Well, but we our Mike, arguments. Michael, Michael gets into. Peter arguments when he's on his own. So the answer to that is probably yes. Yeah, they, 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 they put me in a room in the morning. No, our, our, our main row. arguments, our, our main rivalries. Now, this is our one, our one nod to modernity in our traditional Christmases. Is we have an annual PlayStation Nugent family football tournament. Um, where I play as, as either Bohemians or Leeds okay. my brothers play as, as uh, Barcelona and Juventus 96 one of my brothers doesn't support Juventus he just supports the 96 team okay. and so we have that tournament every year <laughs> right. and that, that will provide enough arguments to okay. keep us going for the we, next decade just, just for my personal research now I'm asking for a friend here uh, which football franchise game allows you to play as the Juventus 96 team well you can make them you, oh, you can, you can design the players. Much hassle. This is the age the of convenience. <laughs> I demand classic eras. I demand some game that comes pre-programmed in Brazil 1970 uh, and nobody else. But it, it's funny though, isn't it? You, like, you know, I, I'm not religious. I'm a humanist. Michael's an atheist. But it doesn't, that actually doesn't have any bearing. I mean, the, the Christmas song that moves me the most is Oh Holy Night. Um, mm. I, I think it is the single most beautiful Christmas song of them all. Um, and and uh, I, I, I mean, I don't see why you have to reject what is beautiful just because it has a religious background to it. Um, I, I certainly would reject a nut roast for Christmas dinner, I have to say. That, that would <laughs> you draw the my, line at that, would you? All my pre-religious <laughs> sensibilities. Is there another point, though, that, that Michael stumbled across there, though, that this idea that people who, you know, I don't know whether you're a vegan or vegetarian or whatever, but that you shouldn't always have to conform to this idea that some animal has given up its life for you to have, uh, you know, the meat sweats at tea time on Christmas Day? So we came in now to have guilt laid on us, did we? <laughs> <laughs> Give me a break. I'm going to have turkey on Christmas Day, okay? okay? Uh, five, I'm three, not going to apologise to anyone okay. for having turkey uh, on Christmas Day. 53106 is the number if you want to lay on some festive guilt as well to our, our, our panel this morning. Uh, Michael, there is one bit uh, that I missed on the, the front page of the Sun Independent that I did want to ask you about. Um, the National Maternity Hospital, uh, Sunday Times, sorry, excuse me, I said I gave the, the wrong title there, Sunday Times. Uh, the National Maternity Hospital has said that an invitation it sent to the inauguration of its new master, describing a key part of the event as a mass was a mistake. Uh, a note accompanying the 100 invitations which were issued in the name of the retired High Court President Nicholas Kearns, who is the Deputy Chair of the National Maternity Hospital at Hollis Street, said the inauguration of incoming Master Shane Higgins on January the 1st would begin with a mass at midday. Uh, Roisin Shortall, Social Democrats TD, observed that this was going to be uh, tone deaf to public concerns and M- NMH spokesman said that the word mass was an error. Um, Every, many people have been pushing for you know the guaranteed you know the secularisation of the new National Maternity Hospital when it's built on the site of St Vincent's. But the existing hospital on Hollis Street, for better for worse, is an institution which has the Archbishop of Dublin as its governor or its chairperson. Is it not appropriate if those people want to pursue uh, the idea of having a mass to mark his arrival as the master of the hospital? to have something without people getting concerned about it. Well, if they want to make it clear that their primary loyalty is to the Vatican and they want to make it clear that they want to exclude people who 
don't have those beliefs, then of course they can do that. But is it loyalty to the Vatican or is it just a, you know, them personally seeking the indulgence of or the, the blessing of whatever deity they hold dear before they take on a very significant job? Well, well, technically it is loyalty to the Vatican. that They do owe their primary loyalty to the Vatican, as do the, the people who run 90% of our primary schools. So th- those are issues. But, but by the way, the state doesn't get a free ride on this either. I mean, we have, fortunately, this year got rid of the blasphemy law, which, mm. which is a, a good step. But we still have prayers at the start of the Doyle every day, prayers at the start of the law term. We still have a, a religious oath required to become president yeah. or judge or the, teacher. The, the, the preamble of the Constitution is, is pretty clear. So yeah. there's a lot to go, uh, you know, and the, you know, we used to be a Catholic country. We're now a, a secular pluralist country increasingly, but still with a lot of Catholic hangovers that we have to, to gradually get rid of. Uh, Fergus, any thoughts on that? Um, just as a matter of fact, Michael, I don't think there's an oath required to become Taoiseach. There is, there is yeah, it's, no, it's because he's a member of the Council of State. And if you're a member of the Council of State, uh, you have to swear the religious oath for it, that. It, for that, but yeah. not, not for Taoiseach. No, no, they do actually, be, because Eamon Gilmore had that problem when he was tarnished. Because Eamon was an atheist. Because he was an atheist, and, and, and he was oh, asking, because we lobbied him about that, and, and we asked him about that. And, and he, what his legal advice was, that if he declined to swear the oath and, uh, um, and thereby be on the Council of State, he would have to resign as Taoiseach. Uh, I'm just looking up the the oath here for the Council of State and it says that every member of the Council of State shall at the first meeting thereof uh, take and subscribe the declaration in the following form in the presence of Almighty God I do solemnly and sincerely promise and declare that I will faithfully and conscientiously fulfil my duties as a member of the Council of State so the fact Michael your case is that as they have to do that in the presence of Almighty God that effectively means that you are required to be Christian it's forcing somebody to to swear an oath that's against their conscience so a conscientious atheist couldn't take up that position so so, I mean look everybody would realise Eamon Gilmore not but every, every, that's up to Eamon's conscience but everybody would realise automatically if you had to swear that there's no God in order to take that what's yeah, office the, the shouldn't exist it shouldn't be there it shouldn't be a, a religious oath shouldn't be formed part of our constitution for any office any office whatsoever um, but this thing about the mass uh, I mean is that just not nutty I mean after all the controversy after all they've been through to actually Send. And the other they interesting thing. Back. They did say that yeah. it was oh, sent they, an yeah, error. They, so they, they appear yeah. to have, have now written it down as an error. The hospital, uh, a spokesman told the Sunday Times, uh, the hospital has organised an act of celebration on the commencement of a new term of the mastership. It is an inclusive act with representatives participating from interfaith and secular communities. Uh, the hospital declined to release the names of the interfaith and secular representatives who are due yeah. to participate. Because because they're still, you. Because no, they're still, I'm curious really to find them. out who the, yeah. these secular yeah. they're still representatives are. to try and find them um, because they realised they made a serious boo-boo um, and, and they're trying to rectify the position now the other interesting thing is the hundred people who had the hundred select people invited um, uh, and, and why is it so so limited I seem to recall that when there was controversy around um, the maternity hospital moving to St. Vincent's I think it might have been mentioned at the time that the board of directors or governors or whatever the structure is may potentially actually have 100 members on it because there are so many civic society and the parish priest of Weston Row was on the board and the archbishop was on the board that there are so many different categories of so it's very in-house. It's very in-house. It was so it would seem to be. But um, Sheila, is there not though, and, and this is the point that I keep finding myself going back to though, that if the new master, I, I have no idea what his, his faith is, the new master who's coming in, uh, Shane Higgins, who's taking over from Rona Mahoney on Tuesday week, um, if he is of the Christian faith and it is a body which still has the Archbishop as its chair and the parish priest as a member of its board, are they not allowed to have like, No, I don't think it's appropriate at all. I, I, I think if they want to have a service to, to mark um, uh, Shane Higgins coming into the role, that's entirely and utterly appropriate and that should be a kind of an interfaith service or some sort of a, you know, a not all, uh, all encompassing. Because bear in mind, this is a hospital that is supposed to, to serve people of all faiths and none. I mean, that's the reality of, of the business of a hospital, isn't it? Why, day why? in, day out. I think they should have, I think it's nice to have a ceremony to mark the, the start well, of it. I mean, nobody, had, nobody did a mass for me when I became chief executive of Bernardo's. You don't, you don't, get a religious ceremony uh, held in your honour because you become the boss of something uh, and you shouldn't I mean that's just nothing well, if it's for, just crazy my taking that is if it's for the it's people who are involved a, in, in, the, in, the, in the business of the hospital you know I, I understand we don't exactly know who the hundred people are that it's, it's a way of you know meeting these people and there's some sort of a service to acknowledge that this is the start of a very important and significant role and that's a good thing I think you that's des- a nice when you decide, thing when you decide but, that you're going to mark the start of somebody's job with religion 
you're making a statement about the import of that job and the code of conduct that will govern that job, etc., etc. Yeah, sure, it's if a you, serious sure, mistake. If you put a look yeah, at it the other way around, hypoth- hypothetically, if anybody got a position in any state-related or public function job and we heard that there is going to be a ceremony uh, to introduce them to that job at which it will be emphasised that there is no God... Everybody would have realised that that's not what the job was about. Whether yeah, there is or isn't I don't God, think there should, I don't think God should come into it at all. I think there should be some sort of... I do kind of like the idea. I can see... I don't, like, care about it one way or the other. I see the logic of having some sort of an introductory ceremony or a ceremony to mark the start of the role. That's it. But I don't think that should be a mass. Absolutely not. I think Rosie Shortle is dead right on this. Like, you know, and I, suppose, and I totally agree with what both of you are saying. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. You know, the reality is it's the start of a job. But I kind of think this is a very important job uh, and that it's, it's tied in. It's not the most the important world. job in the I world. I mean, imagine, imagine somebody being uh, appointed, let's say, Secretary General of the Department of Education and uh, you can't start your job without mass being set or um, Secretary General of the Department of Health or Secretary General of the United Nations and you can't start your job without but it shouldn't be a mass. Do, it's though, not a mass. We do in this mass. country have presidential inaugurations we which do. don't take the formal effect of a mass but there, there is that, that religious infral of blessing yeah, ahead there of is it. A, there, is a, there is a protocol Protocol. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael. Um, there's a protocol that has introduced a lot of religiosity into the inauguration of the presidency. Albeit completely unnecessary. Completely unnecessary. Um, it has no bearing on the constitution or uh, the role or anything of that sort. And in an attempt to um, to make it less religious. Uh, they've now succeeded in making it more religious. I, it, it used to be the case that the cardinal or the archbishop would say a prayer uh, and we'd all go on with the rest of our lives. Now, 17 people have to say prayers or non-prayers or anti-prayers one after the other and the thing goes on for hours and but hours and given hours. given that it's, 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 a, it's a Christian crazy. state and if you read the preamble oh, of the Constitution Christ- 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 but if you read the preamble of the Constitution that it says in the name of the most uh, highly uh, uh, almighty God and in the Christian spirit of the Trinity it's a Christian Constitution and the Constitution establishes the state so that, in effect, whether we like to think of it as secular or not, there is still a kind of a Christian thread that runs through our institutions of state. We are not oh, a Christian yeah. state. It is something that we, that, that we have to gradually that. catch up with. The, the, the Constitution and the laws have to gradually catch up with the reality that the people of Ireland are a pluralist people now. And, and that the only way for the... I, I fully respect everybody's right to freedom of religion or belief and to practice their religions. But the only way for the state to protect equally everybody's right to freedom of religion is for the state to stay out of it and for the state to be neutral. Uh, we do have one text to 53106 who wants Michael to clarify that whether he may or may not believe in God, he, that he is still a firm believer in Santa. Of course, who isn't? Good answer. 53106, number three, further text. Uh, you're listening to On the Record uh, on News Talk this morning. Gavin Riley with you until one o'clock. Back with our panel in just a moment. Uh, some of whom don't believe in God, but all of whom are avowedly firm believers in Santa, all in good faith in that regard. Back in a moment. We've got about three minutes left before I have to let you go, and I do want to ask each of you for your general highlights or takeaway moments from the year. And I'm going to start with you, uh, Michael, your takeaway moment of 2018. Um, politically, it would be the two referendums, the abortion referendum and the blasphemy law referendum. Did you and I were among a band of about 40 people that were still left in the count centre when the blasphemy referendum was declared, were we? That's right, yeah, yeah. But but it was as important, you know, all, all of the, yeah. this gradual dismantling of the church-state relationship in Ireland. In real life outside of politics, normally in a World Cup year, it would be the World Cup. This year, it's the resurgence of Leeds United under Marcelo Bielsa. <laughs> uh, OK, well, uh, there is a Christmas miracle at Orsa if they can beat uh, Aston Villa later on today and they're going to be top for Christmas and that yeah, will Which, which means Christmas you get promoted. Every, everyone who is, who is top at Christmas gets promoted over the last 20 years. Uh, as a Manchester United fan of course I hope that the team that is not top of the table in the Premier League the, this Christmas uh, manages to, to claim the <laughs> ultimate prize we've lost the at this point. Uh, <laughs> OK well just to, to, to before I lose you entirely uh, Fergus Finlay your, your highlight or your takeaway moment from 2018 I, I, I the more I think about it the more I think I it, I probably will encapsulate my highlights in terms of three people um, uh, one of whom sadly is no longer with us I think my th- two my three heroes of the year uh, were Emma Vic uh, and Vicky Phelan mm. uh, and uh, sad to say Joe Schmidt Joe Schmidt Yes, that, that, that's a, a quite unusual name to tack onto the other two. Well, I, I, I know, and I feel very incongruous doing it. I think it's, it's uh, but but 
I mean, if you had been in the Aviva Stadium, we're talking about a real game now, Michael, OK? <laughs> not Leeds United. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 back to, back to she and I will talk about Gaelic football in just a moment, but you yeah. fire ahead. Worry, if you've been in the Aviva Stadium uh, watching Ireland beat the All Blacks, uh, you, you know, especially if you are one of, as I am, one of the dwindling band of people who can say, I was there in 78 and I was there in 19. Were you um, genuinely there? Yes, in, I was there. I can prove it. I was there okay. in, Munst- in Thoman Park in 1978. I know it ages me, but I, I'm <laughs> proud to admit it. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, so I've been there on the two occasions. I met somebody yesterday, actually, who has been at uh, two All Black matches also in his life uh, and has never seen the All Blacks win. Uh, I've actually <laughs> I've never had that look. But, but that aside, I mean, to me, the two most striking people of this year, the two people who put this state to the ultimate kind of test mm. uh, were Emma Vic Mahuna and, and Vicky Phelan uh, and I, you know they, they will long be heroes of mine yeah, I hope those, the, those they and those who are close to them have a very happy Christmas uh, Sheila to conclude your takeaway message from the year yeah I mean I actually I have mm. Vicky Phelan was, was on my list uh, as mm. well I just think she is a true hero uh, and all of the campaigners who have been involved with this Emma Mc, Vic Mahuna um, Stephen Teep as well you know I mean they just for me stand out you know they literally are ordinary people who just took a stand and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, and hopefully their stand will make a massive difference to the lives of others. But also, can I throw in just the brief game sure. of football one? Mulling Octa's win of the Leinster Championship. Oh, here, here. Come on, yes, come on, the yeah. club championships. Like that's, that was just magic. A magical GA yeah. story. The As, minos, as a the former editor of the Longford through. Leader who yeah, now lives in Cavan, you had to take the Stradley I, Powers, I didn't you? I absolutely yeah. have to, yeah. You know, they're my neighbours um, from the rest when of I was a child. can't pronounce it. No. Uh, yeah, you, you, have another, put, you have to put a bit of a yeah into it. Mullignacta. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, which is a parish of, uh, a half parish of 250 odd people. There's 150 odd members of the GAA club. Yeah. There are about 100 of adult age. They are the Leinster Club football champions. It's they amazing. beat uh, Kilmacud Croaks, uh, Dublin Super Club, uh, in the final. And it is seriously one of the great sporting uh, attractions of the season. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. So my thanks to all of you. Fergus Finlay, uh, former CEO of Bernardo's, now a member of the Charities Regulator, uh, former chef to cabinet to the Labour Party. Thank you. Happy Christmas. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sheila Riley, former former editor of the Longford Leader, now head of uh, digital at Iconic News. Thank you for coming in. Happy Christmas. Uh, Michael Nugent, uh, chairman of Atheist Ireland. Happy Christmas to you. Happy Christmas.